Hi, let's do some practice before the coming Google Code Gen 2021 round 1A. And I'm just looking now at the past year, 2020. I know some problems from 1A and 1B, so I'm going to just do 1C. By the way, this is me right here on the photo. I think it's a photo from 2018 or so, the finals. So yeah, we are doing 1C. I didn't see the problems yet. I will obviously start with this one. Not reading it yet though. If you want some more of practice of old rounds, on Thursday, so tomorrow, a day after posting this video, I will go live on Twitch with doing, again, some round one from past years. Uh, so in the description you'll find a link, but just Twitch, Eric Dose, and nickname, just as you do. I'm streaming a few times a week, you can learn something, go follow there. And the only thing I prepared before the contest is this simple templates where almost always they ask you to solve multiple test cases in a single file. So we read the number of test cases, then we iterate for test cases. For each of them, we print case hash number. This is the format they require, and we run test case. So I will copy paste this a lot. Plus, I have some debug uh, templates there, but it shouldn't matter too much. I think I'm ready. Then let's just hit start. Let's start the timer and let's do this. I will make some drawings as well. I'm ready for that here on the side. I wouldn't do this during a contest, but uh, let's do some visualization of what's described in the statement. There are some streets going north, south and west, east. And two points uh, being one unit away, they are, it's called one block away. What next? You know the path that some tour will take. They start somewhere, and you start somewhere. I will assume that I start at zero, zero then. Maybe, maybe I start here, the tour starts there, and it follows some predetermined pre path. and I need to know how quickly I can intersect it. Also, you don't need to solve problems in order, like first problem, then second, then third, but if you look at past results, it's almost always fine to just do it this way. And maybe you will not be able to finish the last problem, but if you're fast enough, you will advance. 1500 people will advance to the second round. How soon can you do it? I think I can go through the tour and I, when I see, let's say, this point, uh, maybe in a different color, I see this point. The tour will be here after two seconds and I will be there after one, two, three, four seconds or whatever. How quickly I can get there, I can compute by taking the delta x and delta y. This is called Manhattan distance from me, zero, zero, to this point. So I start, the, the tour starts here at x, y, and then for each of, uh, each step, north, south, east, uh, east, and west, I need to just update x and y and say, what is my distance until there? Can I be there fast enough? Mm. And I'm not going to read all of this. It would take me a lot of time. I assume that I understand the statement right. So then I can just start coding. And this is uh, one C. And let's copy the templates. Now, the problem name is fun. Maybe. 
maybe first I need to uh, read the input, obviously. What do we have? Just x, y and the string? x, y and the string, yeah. You see I skip out of the statement, but it's just because I usually know how those statements look like. If you are a beginner, you shouldn't do it. You might skip something important. This is enough. Thousand five, yeah, thousand five. X, Y, and the string. Iterate through the string. Let's say the length is n. Update x and y. If north, then something. But how are they numbered? X blocks east, so from west to east, and Y blocks north. Okay, this is just like in math, where uh, coordinates grow like this. This is X, this is Y. So north will increase Y by 1. I could do it with switch, but else if is also fine. South decreases y, east increases x, and finally assert false just in case I'm reading something wrong. If now uh, the distance I need to get there is that, this is what I need. If this doesn't exceed the current time of, of the tour, I think it's i plus 1, then I will finish there. What do I need to print? Number? Just a number. I think that when the tour will be there is what I'm printing and return from the whole function. When I get to the end, let's put impossible and maybe I can be at 0, 0. No, the, the initial point isn't zero, 0, so it's not that before the for loop I can already be there. Copy the sample test. Actually, um, this drawing is uh, very inconvenient for me. It will be easier this way. Uh, if you have monitor big enough, then for sure Put statement on one side of the screen and the statement on the other. I mean, statement and the code. 415. The last case is wrong. Let's see. 27, and then there are out of S's. Why am I printing 1? Do I understand X and Y properly? Maybe I don't read the input right? It's very strange that for 27. I would immediately say that, yeah, I can get there. Let's print with my debugs x and y. Unless I didn't copy it right. Yeah, I didn't copy it right. That's it. I need to copy it <laughs> again to a file and hit new line, I think. And there is now five. All right, let's remove this debug stuff and submit. Need to select the language. Seven minutes passed. There is like what, two hours, three hours for everything? But don't worry about too much, just solve problems starting from the easiest one. If you're good enough then, and you're not unlucky, then you will pass. This is basically how it works. Don't expect some magical hints. It's not that, no. People train for months, they, they practice algorithms, problems, maths. Uh, so just, this is a test on how well you prepared. Not, it's not about tips that you learn at the end. Uh, all right, one problem done, two to go. 
over randomized. There is, a, I think, a long integer m with up to u decimal digits. I first thought that we have something like this. Uh, you provide a number of length u, like maybe 5, 2, 2, 1, 1, 1, and you get a digit as a response, but there is some randomization going on. Each server has a digit string d. D was this, then C would represent zero, O would represent one, and so on. When the server chooses random number from one to M, writes it as base ten string with no leading zeros. random value m, receive the response, it's, this one is hard to understand, uh, but I'm getting there. So we're given a bunch of pairs m comma r then you know m how long is m u is 16 m is 16 digits long then a random number is generated from 1 to m and then it's what is r r is the response It's a pity that they don't explain this with some example as well. All right, then my understanding is this. Let's say that u is 6. Then they say that m is a random number from uh, with six up to six digits let's say that m was generated as seven hundred eight thousand hundred twenty three then they take n a random number up to m so maybe what's generated is this why not and now they use the secret mapping to map digits into characters And maybe like this one is mapped as then S, S, R, R, and S, T. Because apparently 4 maps into S and 2 also maps into S. And what you get is this. Um, the string and M. You get a lot of those pairs. The length U is equal to either 2 R16, R16, what is Q of I? Oh, and in, in there is a subtest. There are three test sets. In some of them, you actually don't know M. Because this is second problem, not third, I'm quite sure that I need to solve it in order to advance. So the time is a bit cut. 
Um, so I'm going to just solve the last st test set. So I don't get this thing. Or instead of crossing it out, I will just say that this is what we get. I assume that we get minus ones instead of m's. And length is 16. Two in the example, but only 16. Right. And the main thing about random numbers <coughs> is that the first digit is special. There, there is a name for this law. Uh, laws first digit small. Benford's law, this thing. There's in statistics where the first digit is usually small, like one or two. In particular, I bet that if we generate a random number m and then generate a random number n up to m, then the first digit is usually one or two rather than eight or nine. This makes sense because the distribution isn't uniform and instead it's skewed towards smaller numbers. So 100 has bigger probability than 900 because 100 was possible for bigger range of m's. <clears throat> so I think I will sort... No. Okay, I will sort characters by frequency of appearing here on the first position. But then there might be... The mapping is not unique, right? Is it guaranteed that D has distinct digits? It has distinct digits here. Let's go to limits. Yeah, D is a string of exactly 10 different uppercase English letters. Right, so what I described previously here is impossible. Uh, we cannot get here S because 4 mapped into S. So I will just look at first digits, or actually first characters in the strings I get. And the most common one is digit 1, then it's 2, 3, and so on, up to 9. There's also a 0. 0 cannot occur here, but it can occur in other positions. So 0 is the character that never occurs on the first position. This is, an, this is a very, very unusual Google Code Gen problem if it's about knowing Benford's law. Am I saying it right? Yeah, Benford's law. And there is very little algorithms going on here. But well, uh, over-randomized. Call it just rand.cpp. Not the rand. And what's the input format? Actually, this is easier to be done with. Uh, never mind. Okay, there is T. Starts with U. Then exactly that many lines follow. In each of them, string R, and then a number. No, Napier for an in, uh, first an integer, then a string. But an integer might be minus one, so we will not use it. There is this, and there is this annoying thing in C++, if you read with scanf, you cannot really read a string. I will create a function for that. Now we have something that reads a string. Q might be minus one, I don't care. And then there is a string. Increase the frequency of the first character. Uh, 
and let's just grab some second character or for all the characters in S I'll insert C I'll have a set for all the characters to at the, to, at the end know what zero maps to a set of all characters now we need to set sort existing characters by frequency on the first position in particular somebody will have frequency of zero to sort conveniently i will have pairs frequency comma the character just call it pairs For all the characters if your frequency is not zero if zero then I will just remember who is zero. By default it's question mark, but I hope it's overwritten here. What else? Pairs plays back uh, the frequency and the character. I think I need exactly nine characters there. smallest frequency will be 9. Uh, what do I need to print? I, I guess the string D, counting from 0. So 0. For every pair in pairs, or reversed, 1 will be the biggest. So let's sort here decreasingly. For everything. The second element of a pair is a character. Okay, load input. In what director am I? YouTube GC. DCJ. Oh, this was just the sample test. I thought that there will be multiple test cases here. And then at least it will be easy to see the output. Should be TPF. TPF, OXL, OXL, blah, blah, up to B. Yep, it worked. Um, let's submit. There is penalty during a contest for a wrong submission. Um, so. It, sometimes you should spend a little bit time before you submit. You should maybe go through your code again, but it's not that likely that four minutes penalty or whatever the penalty is will hurt you that much and you will not advance instead of advancing. It's more important that you really solve a problem. So in case of round one, I suggest that you don't worry about penalties for wrong submissions. At least, it, but of course, don't submit once every minute. If you find a mistake, then sure, resubmit, but don't just, if you don't know what's wrong, don't try random things. Like, oh, maybe this if is wrong, I will try another one, but I don't understand. Yeah, the second problem done. And the last one is oversized pancake choppers. And this is the first problem where it might be optimal not to do the full problem. There are three test sets. Maybe just the first one or the first two will be enough. There are n slices with some angles. I, as I understand, the angle is just like, it will be this part of the triangle. Not really triangle, a slice. 
maybe we will combine them into one big pizza. You have the diners waiting for their food. Single slice. I need to find the D equal slices. I can make cuts. And then I'm guessing already that this is what they're talking about, like maybe split it like this. Maybe split this like that. You can apply further cuts to either or both of these new slices. Leftovers are fine. The smallest total number of cuts. Uh, is D given? Yes, D is given. Well then, if some... Uh, now, should everything be integer? They do not need to be integers. I see. I wanted to say that we will deal with divisors of, or something like that. Maybe not. Even if you have a single slice, if you just have a single slice, I don't know if we should do such visualizations of this problem. Maybe we should just work with numbers. But if you want to get, say, five parts, then no matter what are the other slices, what you can do is just make four, uh, four cuts into the you know, same size. So the answer can be d minus 1. We will just try to do it more efficiently. How can, it, how can we achieve this more efficiently? I think that the only possibility is that we will use more than one slice, maybe this guy and this one, and we will make some number of cuts in each of them, like maybe here one slice and here two slices, so that those sizes will actually turn out to be the same. Like this is the same as that, as that, this one, and this one. Here. For this, we would if size of initial size of the first slice is A and this one is B, we would need this equality to be true. A over 2 is equal to B over 3. Or if you move this around, 3A is equal to B. Maybe that's useful. I still think that maybe just integers will be optimal. Maybe. We can do this only if A is divisible by 2, B is divisible by 3, well, and the ratio is the same. If we actually want six slices rather than five, then we can also take from some another slice, uh, we can kind of destroy it and do it like this. So maybe this will be left over. But if the slice was enough to make a single good part with same size as those, then we are good. How many, how many cuts did I make here? I made four cuts in order to get six slices. The savings is equal to two. So I have six slices, but only four cuts. And this is because for two, two slices, two initial slices, I cut them into equal parts without any leftovers. Okay, i minus 1 cuts in order to get i parts. The savings over just d will be the number of slices that I fully use. In test set 1, d is 3 or 2. And if you don't have a lot of time left, also you should estimate your chances looking at the leaderboard at this point of the contest but if you for some time don't have any idea for the full problem or just it's little time left till the end then we should just be done we should just solve this first test set 
I would go for the full score most likely because just I usually pass to second or third round. Actually, I us I sometimes pass to the finals. Uh, but I treat this video more like advice for you rather than practice for myself. Can we do d equal to two? If you want two equal parts, then it's just about finding two equal slices or cutting one into two. I think the solution for d equal to two is just check if there are two slices of equal size. If yes, then the answer is zero. Zero cuts are needed. What about d equal to three? Then I think that we also need to look for those cases where something is twice bigger. This is x, this is 2x. And it's very small, so we can check it with brute force. This, or this is one possibility, but also something like this is x, this is x as well, and here there's something bigger than x, maybe x plus 1. And here one cut is enough. I think those are non-trivial scenarios, but also maybe you will just find three equal slices. So let's do this. Let's assume that I have little time till the end of the contest. That's not the case for me here. It's 30 minutes, so more than two hours, I think. I, I really don't know what is the duration of the first round. I think it's around three hours. Maybe two. Don't quote me on this. Okay, let's do this bunch of ifs. And then if you do this with a good enough time, you should pass, usually. You can look through past years, uh, the round 1 A, B, C. By the way, round 1 A is the hardest to pass because everybody is allowed to participate. Then in 1 B, already 1,500 of the best people advanced, and then the remaining pool of participants is much smaller. It's easier to get to top 1500 in 1B or 1C. Uh, we have choppers. Uh, I made a typo, Jean. Assume that D is two or three. We have N and D. I will here already made an assert. If D is bigger than I don't know for now how to solve the problem. A is huge. Like it's not even int, it's a long long. Right. Maybe sorting it will be useful. I don't know. It doesn't hurt. So any small so I can I can sort the, uh, no. State, I just print yes or no. Oh, I print the smaller, smallest possible number of cuts. No. If these two. I always can achieve this with a single cut of one slice into two equal parts. It's just about checking if there are two equal numbers in the input. If I sorted numbers, and let's actually return the answer. Uh, I, it's enough for me to check neighbors because I sorted. In this case, return zero, otherwise, return one. Now, this four, I checked here that it's two or three, so if it's not two, then it's three. Did I say four? It's three. This is three. If there are three equal numbers. This also guarantees that the middle of them is the same. If this is the case, return zero. No. 
if and this part I will make it in quadratic time, you can use for, so, for sure like a hash set to get linear time. I don't want to make my code more complicated. Uh, if we have a case where twice AI is equal to AJ, then that's the left part of the drawing and one cut is enough. The right part of the drawing, I need two equal parts. and something bigger to exist. So I will just assume that the last element is big enough. This is why I don't try to compare two last elements. If I have, for example, a, a, after sorting, of course, a 0, 1, 2, and 3, and 4, this for loop, the last adjacent pair it checks is a2, a3. So it will stop at comparing with i equal to 2, and it will check that if this pair is equal, because if it is equal, then this will be our x plus 1. Or if it's actually equal to the previous two elements, then the first for loop would be triggered and we would finish here. So if this is the case, then along with the last element, which must be bigger than us, we say return 1. That's the right part of the trunk. For sure it's possible that I missed something. Do we have here something with small d? I mean, do we have here bigger d? No, it's 3, 2, 3, 2. I'm not printing anything, I should do it here. Two zero one one two zero one one indeed. Thirty five minutes, almost thirty six. Instead of waiting for the verdict, I need to start thinking about bigger D. If I if I use a bunch of slices. They should be similar in some way. Like if one of them I split into three parts, the other into seven parts, it must mean that they preserve some kind of ratio. I still think that it's about common divisor. If a divided by three is equal to b divided by seven, then I think that a must be divisible by three and b must be divisible by seven. I passed the first test set, so now I have all the points minus uh, those for test set 2 and test set 3. So for this problem, I just got points for test set 1. The points for each problem you can see in the leaderboard here. I'm not sure if it's written also in the problem statement. I don't see the scoring here. So now I'm focusing on test set 2. We see here that sometimes n is bigger, so we will need to speed up, I guess, n cubic into n square, but very fast n square, if n can be 10,000. Uh, still, d up to 50 is the main difficulty. So I think they must have a common divisor. Maybe the common divisor is 1. Like maybe it's like this, a is 3, b is 7, then you can cut a into 3 equal parts, b into 7 equal parts, in total you get 10 equal parts, you can also cut those into even smaller parts. So it seems that we iterate over gcd, of A and B, assuming that we use two slices, A and B. And it's actually bigger, it's 300. But this is very small, the number of parts we need to get. So for every number AI, I can... For every AI, actually for every I from 0 to n minus 1, 
for every, let's say, number of cuts, C, from 1 to D, I assume that I cut AI into that many pieces of equal size. So size of a single piece will be AI divided by C. I know this size. And then I can iterate over other slices and check if it's divisible exactly by this size. If it's not divisible, then how many slices I can get from you? This seems legit. And here we have complexity n times d times, if I here iterate over other mm, slices, then it will be another n, so it will not pass the last test set. Also, this is not an integer. We need to deal with that smartly, without perfectly without using real values, because real values suck. They, they are not precise. And sometimes when you check for equality, you will not check properly. Um, for every other like slice j, we need to check if this is divisible in some way by size. Let's call this size. This must, might be non-integer, but still, if it's something like 1.5, and then you have a of j equal to 6, then you know that 6 is divisible by 1.5, even though this is non-integer. This divisibility still exists. Just when I check, I, and I don't need to compute this as a real value. When I check if a j is divisible, Here's another lesson. During an important contest, right now I'm just practicing, but during an important contest, you should mute your phone. Uh, how to check if AJ is divisible by something like this, which might be non-integer. Uh, as well, you can check, you can multiply both sides by C. So you're checking this. Am I right? I think so, yeah. And like when you check if 6 is divisible by 3 divided by 2, 1.5, it's like checking if 24 is divisible by, not 24, 2 times 6. So it's like checking if 12 is divisible by 3. It is, because 12 divided by 3 is 4, just like 6 divided by 1.5 is 4. So I will actually check this. In brackets, this is what I'm checking. Uh, and even if that's not the case, I need to check, count how many times it fits. To know that, oh, this kind of big slice, it's not divisible perfectly, but if I need to have this uh, size of you know, one part, then I can fit here five such parts by using five cuts for this, and I will have some leftovers. 
and then here after iterating over all those j's i will um, like with priority uh, first use those perfectly divisible and because we need to minimize the number of cuts we maximize our savings and i already said why savings is equal uh, this is the number of slices that we use to divide perfectly of perfectly divided slices from the input so i first try to use those that are divisible but not many times for example if size that i want to achieve is 2 and i have let's say a of z equal to a of 0 equal to 10 and a of 1 is equal to 50 it's better to use this one to get five parts of size 2 because i want if possible maybe here i will have another small one and i will use both this one and this one both divisible by 2 and i will have more savings I want to use a lot of small numbers divisible by the size. So that's the scheme. That's the, let's say, draft. Uh, if I, I can remove this code, I think, because anyway, it's here if I need it. So let's do exactly that. Mm, sorting actually still can stay. Okay, and now kind of just rewriting the. <laughs> it, it's it's getting serious when I go full screen with my editor. Uh, yeah, for every AI, which actually meant for every I. Answer by default is D, but maybe or maybe better. I maximize savings. Savings is the number of slices I perfectly cut into the same size cuts, same size parts. And we will print d minus savings. And for every i, or for every c, is the number of parts I cut this A of I into for every other slice J. Sometimes I use plus plus J, sometimes J plus plus. Don't worry about it. Doesn't matter. I skip if it's exactly this one, but otherwise. Or actually, should I treat this one in a special way? I don't need to do it, do I? I will skip it. Mm, check if this is divisible. So actually, I check this. If c times a of j, this is already a long, long, so it, there is no overflow. This is perfectly divisible. Then we have this. This is the number of equal parts I can get out of it else this division is rounded down so it will be like with leftovers if something has size 11 and the size is of a single part i want to get is two i will get here five And now I prioritize perfect and I prioritize small sizes there. Mm, I don't want you because it didn't let me compile. Actually, I also want this guy. Just it will tell me that yeah, I'm also providing some equal parts. Should I do knapsack on those? 
I think I don't need that. Just take small and whenever we exceed D, just we cannot take the next one and that's it. I think we don't need knapsack to perfectly fit D. For everything in perfect. If, uh, let's say some kind of taken. If we don't exceed D, increase by X and my savings plus plus. This will not exceed N, so I don't need long long for that. Else others plus equal X. And for everything in non-perfect, apparently I didn't even need a vector for that. I didn't need to gather them. I'll just say this. And now I hope that in total I have at least D. And then the answer I maximize with my savings. So if this is legit and I can get at least D pieces like I wanted, then I consider this amount of savings. To zero one one, and at this point, let's create one more test with bigger d. Let's say that d is ten, and I have a equal to seventy and b equal to three. This can be perfectly cut, and I think I will have two savings, so the answer will be eight instead of ten. It's eight indeed. But if here I had thirty-one, it would it would be nine. Now let's say that actually I want eleven parts. Yeah, it's messed up completely. But here, if there's third element, and if it's at least ten, like let's say fifteen, then we get two of savings. Eleven minus two, that's nine. Correct. But if this was too small, it's ten. Good. I think I properly checked the logic, the special cases of what happens with others. So this should pass the next test, this one. And then there's test set three. My current complexity is uh, n squared times d, maybe multiplied by some kind of logarithm from sorting. It doesn't matter too much. It's log of, I think, n. Uh, a very fast n square would pass because n square is around 100 million. And this is what a computer can do in a second or a few seconds. But multiplied by then 50 and by logarithm, no, no chance. But if you don't have a terrible time, this should be enough, I think, to pass the round. Uh, you will not have this access to the final leaderboard during a contest, but we can take a look here. The winner uh, had time of 35 minutes. Uh, but you should not aim to win unless it's unless you are already very good. Oh, but here we see that getting the last test set in the third problem gives you top 50 and 1500 people pass so yeah we don't need that as but i hope that i have here a correct solution still judging oh yeah and if i get the second test set out of three then i'm already at least top 400 or something maybe even i don't need anything here what we need 1500 if you solve just two problems in time of around one hour up to one hour and 16 minutes then you would advance uh, but if with any time you get the last problem you're good 
We see that a lot of people tried for the equal to two or three. Mm, what's the worst time here? Two and eight, two fifty-seven. Okay, then that's with a lot of penalty time. I think from this that the round lasted two hours and thirty minutes. Round overview. Well, this is some summary. Score of 58, I just fast enough, is good enough to advance. In this particular round, you could also skip second problem and pass the last one, but I think it's not the easiest way to advance to the second round. Yep, here I'm already, I already have much more points that needed to advance. You can on your own try to solve the last test set. There is also analysis here, but we shouldn't be far away. I'm not going to do it now. Mm. But I think that for every... The, the perfect part should be easier. Because if something is divisible, then I think it has some common GCD. Yeah, no, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but there is analysis. So, no, you can just go to either link in the description or Google Code Gem Archive year 2020 round 1C, and there is analysis button with description of a solution. So, right now, very quickly, I will show it to you, but you can cover your eyes. Here you go, scrolling down. You know, you can read here about tested three. I will later on my own time. Now I'm done showing the analysis. Spoilers. Mm, on maybe today in the evening I will on my own think a moment about this to just know the solution. But this video was supposed to help you to prepare just a little bit for round one. But again, preparing for any kind of contest is about months and years of practice. It's not that you will get some final tips. Of course, you will get some, but they are not crucial. Prepare templates before the round. Uh, if you're really stuck on a problem, then maybe give the statement another read. But those are general uh, pieces of advice not really related to Google Code Gem. Oh, something particular to Google Code Gem is grab from one of previous rounds the interactive problem and try to solve it just to get the hang of the interactor system. Because you download something in Python, you run it yourself. And I don't recommend just typing here in this editor, because with your own operating system, you have the advantage that you can run stuff here. You can test it. You can print some debug information. That's, I think, more convenient. And once again, go to twitch.tv slash ericto tomorrow on Thursday, and like three times a week. Uh, but tomorrow I'm going to just solve life another round one from past Google Code Gem years. I'm not sure yet which one. Yep. That's it. Thank you all for watching and good luck during the round 1A or then also 1B and 1C. But hopefully you're already you will already advance in one day. Yeah. Bye.